So you come back home and you make the Clumsy Record, which is an album that uh, you know sold twenty and twenty-five thousand copies a week for months. And we suck, snuck in an Alanis, the Canadian Alanis Morissette jagged little pill tour in the, in middle, the middle of that, of that record, testing out those songs. That's right. I yeah. forgot so that record. kind of was a, the last kind of time before we <laughs> went went. And we got to see a whole batch of people that had no idea who we were before that record came out. And then when that record came out, all those people in all those arenas were still like, wow. And most of them are like 12-year-old kids. So we, that's what you know, could have been the beginning of the, you know, that next year being like us and the Spice Girls, you know, <laughs> neck and neck in record sales, which it, is it, ridiculous. It, was, <laughs> it's, it remains a real rarity, a Canadian album that sells a million copies in Canada. That's how big the clumsy record was. It was up there with, well, Jagged Little Pill. It's up there with Thriller. It's up there with Led Zeppelin IV and all these other, you know, big name records that have sold a million. Well, essentially, one in thir three, one in thirty people in Canada have a copy of that record. Yeah, it was pretty. It was it was pretty phenomenal. But um, that was the catch in the wave, big time. It was. Yeah, we that didn't was, know. You know was, that was just one of those things. <laughs> that, you know, I'm. I'm, yeah, I think it is a good record, but it was the timing. You know, the stars kind of aligned. You couldn't go. Well, it was it was that time of rock. Yeah. When that kind of music was in huge demand, and you guys were the full package. I mean, even if you look at the album cover, you know, there's Saul Fox really hanging from his trapeze for the very first time. Uh, that visual stamp on an already peace album that people gravitated towards. Yeah. We should, this is a good, good, good time to talk about Saul. I mean, we've, we've talked about it before, but let's get it in the context of this conversation. Um, the old dude on these records is a guy you met and were inspired by. Yeah, I mean, when, you know, talking about going back to the title for the record, Naveed, and, and the meaning behind the name, the bearer of good news, you know, we wanted to somehow encapsulate this, uh, and we, we always thought it'd be a person's face, you know, someone who had this face and that would just ooze wisdom, you know, and as young, you know, and you had that Birdman concept because you saw that dude outside of your hotel as well. Yeah, yeah, I was guy in covered with that had a lot to do with it as well. Yeah, and it was basically just trying to find <laughs> this guy that would sum up the record in a, in you know in in one photo, and it ended up that we just met the right person and you know developed this relationship with him, and just this really inspiring guy that we, you know, learned to to kind of. I don't know. He just had he had that. That essence. It was very Canadian on one hand, but very worldly on the other. And he was just, uh, just an amazing man. That um, every time we we thought about another record and a record cover, it, it it just felt like impossible not to include it because, you know, the days that we had the shoots with him and and then even filming all the clumsy stuff. And he kind of went way way out of out of uh, out of the atmosphere in terms of what he did for us in clumsy. And this old guy getting to climb up a rope and. Um, climb up or climb a ladder, just all the, those couple of days, you know, he wasn't a, a young man, so it was, I f we feel like we, we owe him a lot in terms of what he's given to us visually. By this time, Duncan's firm, firmly in the band. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, I joined the end of the, right after Van Halen, so the end of the touring for Naveed. Mm -hmm. So after, ju seven years after <laughs> hooking up with Rain in the Warehouse, you yeah. finally get yeah. to be part of the band. Yep. Yeah. He skips the whole I skip the band school bus. stage, like the first Guitar Hero, you know, stage. Like you, you get out of the van, you're in, you're in arenas in a bus. Boom! There's Coots right there. I, we, I like, wish, we like to bug him about it. I now. wish I'd been part of the band. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with 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 the clumsy record, um, tons of singles from this album. Is there a favorite? Part of this, are there favorite songs from this record? I still love Clumsy, you know. We play it every night, and I think, I mean, obviously, I think we play those songs a lot better than they were recorded now. Mm. But there's just something that um, it, it's one of those songs that just automatically um, takes away any barrier between the, the crowd and, and us, you know. And, and it's this really interactive thing, and you just, as soon as we get to that song, if we haven't. If, if the point in our set hasn't, we haven't breached that barrier yet, that song does it. And I, and I, why? Forever grateful for that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I th you know, it's one of those intangible things, especially, you know, when it's your own song you know, as a band, you can't you usually put your finger on why, but there's, 
there's some, maybe something in the lyric or just that beautiful thing when a, a, a lyric and, a, and, a, and, and the music underneath it create this, this special thing, but it just really, it lets everyone in the audience kind of, I think, you know, their, their wall comes down to their shield and they become just as much invested in, in the show as us. I seem to recall around this time, 97, 98, is when we start to see the establishment of a really rabid, really well-organized, really well-orchestrated online presence, either by you guys or by fans. Well, by fans. Yeah, fans were rabid online, and we created a community so they could... I didn't get online until last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were at the... the, the, the uh, Clumsy Congress, it was called, and then there was a Transparent Humans as well, and they were just basically message message boards and places where they could communicate, and they kind of, in in our sense, it's like they got too big for their britches almost right away because every time we would, you know, kind of communicate, it'd be like, why aren't you doing this and why aren't you doing that and why it's just, it's huge and mighty, but they they do their thing, but it's amazing that that happened. Kind of what, where the internet was just really taking hold as well, mm -hmm. especially in Canada, you know, 1998 to, you know, 99, it was a pretty big year for people. Well, it's, it's definitely transcended the band. You know, even on this last tour, yeah. we've been given tour books of, from our fans, from the Clumsy Congress or, you know, and, and these people come to shows and they write CC in their hand and they're these gangs of people, you know, and... Clumsy Marky and all that. So. And yeah. they have... Uh, Relation, you know, friendships that they built from people around the world, you know, and it's it's amazing. They they show us pictures of like, you know, thirty or forty fans getting together, all staying at the same hotel to see a show, you know, in Texas or it'll be in Montreal, and, it, and it, it's just, it's kind of, I mean, it's it's humbling, and it's also cr crazy. To think now they've about. morphed into the clumsy monkey dot net. That's kind of where the latest group faction is, and then we have our lady peace dot net <laughs> now, where they can kind of get the information firsthand and we have our boy Rich here on it who's you know kind of <coughs> now it's gotten to the point where we have to have someone on the road that's yeah. constantly communicating and giving information and you know just another opportunity because it's such a vast well just like majority. Carl does with uh, with Weezer yeah same same kind of thing and the the relationship between Weezer and their community of fans is incredibly tight yeah mm -hmm. um, but I, you guys were there first with this kind of online relationship, whether or not you started it or not, I mean, that's 97, 98. That's 13 years ago. And in internet time, that's an eternity. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. It, it, I mean, it was, I think at the beginning, it was, it was easy and it got a little overwhelming. And now we're, I think we're now, we're just trying to get a handle on it again. It's, <laughs> it's interesting. We're trying to, to reclaim your, your online yeah. space. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So we move on to the third album, which uh, is the most awkwardly entitled album of the 20th century. Uh, Happiness is not a fish you can catch. This interview. <laughs> okay, please, please explain <laughs> the title to me. Isn't, I'm wait, wait, isn't that Atlantis one way more? You know. Well, the, yeah, but the one is an entire pond. Okay. The pond, okay. the pond all, right, all right, all right. And Atlanta, all, all Atlantis Morissette records sound like it's Yoda, you know, yeah. under rug swept, you know. <laughs> Under bong <laughs> ripped. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So who came up with the title? I don't See, even know. See, you're the, the yeah. literary guy, right? I, I, I mean, I think it, it's always been, um, you know, I think all the records, there's an element that's about searching and trying to gain that wisdom from dating back to Naveed. And it was just, you know... I, I would say there was a bit of it is is it was in the struggle of clumsy, you know, and getting getting comfortable with, you know, that newfound kind of spot we had in music and, and struggling a bit with all the the stuff that goes along with it and coming back after touring for so long and, and doing really well. You know, we did our first arena tour and toured the world and then coming back and going into the same place to record another record. There was something to be said for trying to kind of um analyze and, and and figure out where we were as a band and, and for me as a lyricist so you know the thing about happiness it was it was realizing that um, it's it's not going to be easy I think 